is a piece of advice that I see regularly. It kind of doesn't really matter uh, what I'm reading about at the time, but you regularly read the advice to focus on the essentials and don't get distracted by what doesn't matter. Do the important things. Do what has to be done instead of the things that are just nice to do, or at least do them first. Today's Reformation celebration reminds us that the same thing applies in our spiritual lives. Reformation is the festival of the continuing reformation of the church. And the essential thing about Reformation is that we are reforming around the essential thing. That is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not made right with God and given forgiveness of sins and eternal life because of any merits or works that we do. We receive forgiveness of sins, righteousness and eternal life by grace, through faith on account of Christ's work and merit. The gospel is the great and essential gift of God by which our confessors, early confessors said, the church stands or falls. If we get this right, we stand. If we don't get it right, we fail. The gospel is the essential thing in any Christian life. All the other things that surround it, even those things that sometimes enable us to receive it, are secondary to it. On Reformation Day, we are reminded that the gift of God is the important thing. But we mustn't be distracted by the packaging in which that gift comes to us. In confessing the nature of the church as the gathering of believers, in declaring that the unity of the church depends on the gospel and the sacraments, the early Lutherans were trying to hone in on the one thing in Christian life that really matters, and to put everything else there in its place. At the end of the article, just as we, we read today, at the end of the article on the church, they quote St. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. And this is what he says. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you have been called. Notice here again the great gospel gift that our Christian walk begins not in our effort, but in God's calling. As Luther's explanation in the school catechism says, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel. And St. Paul urges that having been called by God, we are now to, and to be the people of God, we are then to live as the people of God. Because it's not just me that the Holy Spirit calls. Again, as the small catechism goes on, God, uh, the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, invites, and sanctifies not just me, but the whole Christian church and all believers in Christ. What is that calling? It's nothing less than a life which is gifted to us as a life lived with the triune God. This comes from Ephesians chapter 4, where there's three sets of things Paul says, one for spirit, one for the Son, and one for the Father. The calling is directly the work of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your Lord. But through the Spirit of God, God's call creates faith in us. We become recipients in the hope of God's future salvation. We are united together into one spiritual body of Christ. And again, just note that the unity that we have with each other is a spiritual gift given by the presence of the Holy Spirit. But that one calling brings us then into unity also with Christ. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And grammatically those three kind of tie together. Of course there is one Lord, the one Lord Jesus Christ who has called us to be united to him. And there is the one faith, that trust in Jesus Christ in whom alone we find salvation and in whom we trust. And there is one baptism, that baptism into the name of Jesus by water that joins us to Christ in his death and resurrection. These are the things that Christians hold in common, and these are the things that hold us together. 
that we all serve the one Lord, having the same trust and having received that same promise of God in baptism. <coughs> that means, as Galatians says, that we have clothed ourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, no is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And we are all heirs of God's promise. Our calling is to live in Christ, to grow in being like Christ, and to be active, vital members of the body of Christ, both receiving blessing from others and blessing them in our turn. And our gifted calling finally, and again in three phrases, is to be in right relationship with that one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. We are individually, each one of us, called to be a child of God. And we are collectively called to be the children of God. And this call is an effectual call. That means it creates what it says. So God's call summons us and moves us into right relationship with him through the gospel of Jesus and through the work of the Holy Spirit. These are the essential things. This call of God through the gospel of Jesus is the essence of the church. And our unity is therefore found in the gospel. It's found in the gospel in its proclaimed form. That is, as we read in our Bible, uh, as we hear it preached in Bible study, in the assurance of others, uh, as other Christians talk to us, as we hear the word of God, and this gospel comes to us in the enacted form of the sacraments, where God delivers his promise to us in physical signs, so that we may know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God's promise is for us. What the early Lutherans were saying is that this is what really matters, and that we mustn't let other things distract us from them. The problem is that we are so easily distracted. Because if these are the essential things, then it means that some of the other things are not essential. If our unity lies in the gospel, then it doesn't lie in the other things. As it says elsewhere in the Lutheran Confessions, and the language is, you know, I mean, it's a bit complicated, but bear with it. We believe, teach, and confess that the community of God in every locality and every age has authority to change such ceremonies according to circumstances, as it may be most profitable and edifying to the community of God. Ceremonies there. You can see it's like, which song, which tune are we going to sing that song to? Are we going to sing the contemporary songs or the old songs? Are we going to sit for the song or are we going to stand for the song? All these things the Lutheran confessors would say, that's up to us. We have freedom to change them according to what we think is profitable and edifying to the community of God. And so happy to have your feedback on how we do things here. And they go on and they say, and we believe, teach, and confess that no church should condemn another because it has fewer or more external ceremonies not commanded by God as long as there's mutual agreement in doctrine and the right use of the sacraments. So the fact that we sit for this song and other people stand for the song doesn't matter. The fact that we sing this tune and that song, you know, they sing that tune, doesn't matter. That our unity in Christ is not broken by our differences. And as we particularly begin to gather together, two services come together to worship God in one, this is really important because some of this stuff is going to feel uncomfortable. Because suddenly we're standing where we used to sit. And, you know, I think most of you are used to the fact now that actually it wasn't my plan to stand there. You know, sort of, and next week we won't stand for the gospel, we'll probably stand for the creed. And that doesn't matter. If you think that it's more profitable to do it another way, let me know. We can talk about that. But it's not an essence. What this means for us here at St. Mark's, and as Christians in the Church of God, is that outside of the things that have been commanded by God, we have freedom to order our worship, to order our church, to have the external ceremonies of worship, 
whatever we think will be useful for us. Whether we sing hymns or contemporary songs is a matter of complete freedom. Of course, there are some hymns that are better than others. There are some songs that are better than others. There are ways that speak more effectively or communicate more clearly, and that's important. So don't mishear me that that stuff's not important. What's important to you is important. But what the confessors are saying is that the external forms of our worship do not break our deep unity in Christ. To allow them to do that would be to put them on a par with the gospel. And the reality is that whenever we put anything on a par with the gospel, we are in fact opposing the gospel. When we take human preferences, human rules, human understandings, and put them on a par with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are in fact suddenly turning those things into ways by which you are saved, and therefore in opposition to the salvation that comes in Christ. So put simply, it comes to this, my preferences are my preferences. I shouldn't confuse them. God's preferences. And let me also just say, uh, I'm aware that because I'm the pastor in this place, my preferences get a fair look into <laughs> <laughs> Because it's me who's deciding week by week whether we're standing for this or that. But I, as I, even as I'm preaching this and as I was preparing it, I'm going to have a bad conscience about this because I understand that my preferences automatically get taken into account by the fact that I'm making those decisions. So if my preferences are running over the top of yours, you need to let me know. Okay? We as a community have the right to determine what's beneficial for our community. But my preferences are my preferences. That's all they are. And your preferences are just your preferences too. <laughs> of course, that is really challenging. What I mean is that I need to value the gospel more than I value the forms in which I prefer to receive the gospel. I need to value my calling and relationship with God more than the particular forms that I have grown used to expressing my calling and relationship with God. And that applies even to something like prayer. There are all types of prayer, and some types of prayer appeal to me more than others, and they deeply feed me, and there are other types of prayer that kind of leave me cold. But other people are enriched by the other things. That's good, because God is acting with people in a variety of ways in our community. But if I were to insist only on ever praying in the ways in which I feel most comfortable, then I'm denying the freedom that I have in the gospel. Not only that, but in the denial of the freedom of the gospel, I then also deny God the opportunity to stretch me and grow me through those other ways of prayer. I, for example, may like to have religious heart around the house. I might like the, the richness and the fullness of sensory worship, and there are other people for whom sensory worship just doesn't work at all, and they don't want pictures around the place. They want to express their faith in ways that are less sensory. But that should not break our fundamental unity in Christ. And the presence of art or the lack of art should never become more important to us than the gospel. Now that's hard. We are all inclined to want things the way we want things. I mean, that's by definition, isn't it? It requires spiritual maturity. The Holy Spirit has united us to the one body of Christ, and in that one body of Christ, and particularly now as we come together, we are going to have to deal with my preferences, and your preferences, and their preferences, and everybody's preferences. Mm. And we're also going to have to remember keep the main thing, the main thing. Our preferences are important. They're just not the most important. But that's hard for human beings. We are naturally selfish, and we like things in the way that makes us feel comfortable. 
the spiritual struggle to keep the gospel in both word and sacrament at the center of our individual life and of our life together. That's the struggle. And St. Paul in Ephesians 4 tells us something about that. He urges us to live a life worthy of our calling. Both of those words, worthy of our calling, he doesn't mean a life that would earn your calling or a life that somehow merits the calling. What he means is we should live a life that is in keeping with it and gives expression to the calling that we have received. And what that life looks like is a life that is lived, and I quote, with all humility and gentleness, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Humility is that attitude of mind that enables you to see people other than yourself. You consider their interests and needs as also important. It's a recognition of our own limitations and need for grace, which results then in our ability to be more favourable to other people's limitations and needs for grace. Gentleness is consideration towards others, using your strength to assist others instead of using your strength to assert your personal interests and your personal rights at the expense of others. And what a giveaway! What a giveaway about what community life is going to be like. If you ever thought life in the truth is going to be easy, this is the same Paul say, we need to bear with one another. Mm. To put up with the faults and the idiosyncrasies of other people. And to do that, he says, not begrudgingly, but to do it in the kind of love that expresses the character of God. He calls us to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And again, that unity of the Spirit, hear that word, maintain it. We don't create the unity of the Spirit, that is given to us. But with that comes the calling then also to maintain it in the bond of peace, to seek, in tra to live in tranquility with each other and with our conflict. Of course we will all have our preferences, and in love we will try to meet everybody's preferences, but our unity in Christ is bigger than getting things my way. It's bigger than getting things your way. The calling of God in Christ will sometimes move us to put aside our preferences so that we can be united around the things that really matter. We share the life of the triune God. That, in the end, is the key. Where do we get this humility from? Where does this gentleness and love and bearing up with one another flow from? Well, we get it from God. In the grammar of Ephesians 4, he says, do all this, and then he goes on to, there is one body, one spirit, one hope. We get it from God. We have a calling from God who is the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We have the one Lord Jesus Christ. We've all received baptism into him and we share our faith and trust in him. We have the Holy Spirit who gives us this unity, who has brought us into the one body and gives us that unity and then also holds us together in one hope. It is from the Father and the Son and the Spirit then that we have this spiritual capacity to bear with one another, to hold the essentials, to put aside our preferences, even to sacrifice for the sake of the unity of Christ. When we recognize the greatness of the gift, we will be less concerned about the rapid And so on this Reformation Day, let us be reformed around the gospel of Jesus. Remember that you have a high and holy calling that is given to you by grace through faith on account of Christ without your merit or good works. And let that form you so that we keep the essential things, the essential things. On the gospel, there can be no compromise. 
The unity of the church comes from the purity of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. But the truth, but that truth about where the unity of the church comes from sets us free. Jesus in the gospel today. It sets us free from all sorts of things. It sets us free from fear. The gospel of Jesus sets us free from guilt. The gospel sets us free from shame. It sets us free from striving to please God and always wondering whether we've waited or not. And it sets us free to find unity in the midst of our diversity. It sets us free from even our own preferences. So today, open the package. Enjoy the racket. But receive the real gift.